Hello from London. Welcome to our webinar, Turning Fraud Management from Pain Point to Growth Engine for Online Travel Merchants. Brought to you by Riskified and IATA. I'm Didi Doak, Head of Content Production for Airlines, the official membership magazine for IATA. Our guests today are Pascal Buchner, CIO, IATA, Diego Casasnovas, Payments and Finance Manager, Air Europa, and Emily Grunzweig, Senior Fraud and Data Insights Analyst, Riskified. Today we'll hear from our speakers, and in the last 15 minutes, we will take your questions. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a message box for you to write out and send us your questions. You can submit them at any time during our program, and we'll take as many questions as we can in those last 15 minutes. So, to our first speaker today, Pascal Buchner of IATA, who will tell us about top fraud-related issues facing the airline industry today and the transformation technology is making in how airlines deal with those issues. Pascal. Thank you, Didi. So, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, today, actually, I would like to share with you IATA's views in terms of digital transformation, digital business transformation, and in particular, I would like to show you what are the opportunities that artificial intelligence brings to uh, the industry in terms of financial processes. Um, this work is in line, you know, with the vision of IATA, innovation is a big part of IATA vision. The role of IATA is to work with the industry, not only the airline, uh, to identify innovation linked to new technology and to have them adopted by all parties and accepted by regulators uh, if, uh, if needed. I will go to the next slide and before uh, we talk uh, about um, what we can do, I think that I would like to define what we call digital business transformation. Uh, all of you, you know that we started in 2000 with the web, so at this time it was about connecting people. Uh, we added some business, and so we did e-business, we did digital marketing so until uh, 2015. And only four years ago, we added things to the, to the Internet with the Internet of Things. And this, of course, opened the door of the, the digital business. Now, in addition to things, we see uh, smart machines and we see biosensors that are also uh, coming into the game and that offering new capabilities, capabilities for machines to have a predominant role in human augmentation activities. So we have a machine that are almost autonomous, uh, but also you have the connected objects that are enhancing the customer experience uh, while you are shopping or while you are consuming, you know, the service that you have bought. So for IATA, digital business transformation means the creation of new business model that will combine physical, digital, and biolo biological world. Physical, you know that it's about autonomous vehicle. It's about 3D printing or ad additive manufacturing. It's about robotics. In terms of digital, it's about IoT. It's about blockchain. It's about the new platform and, of course, artificial intelligence, and we will speak about that. And biological also. It's about genetic engineering, it's about sequencing and genotyping, and it's about biofensure. So really, the, the, the digital business transformation is really the combination of, you know, the three worlds and how we can take advantage of this. And I will try to show you how we can apply this to our problem, which is fraud management. So the problem that we have, we have two levels of problem. One, for uh, travel agencies, and one for cart holders. 
And we can see that the biggest problem that we have for travel agencies is related to uh, agent default or actually uh, bust out. It's about self-spike. It's about bank guarantee authentication. It's about fake invoices. It's about changing uh, beneficiaries. It's about, you know, void reform, where many at the card order level, level, it is about uh, card scams. Uh, using, you know, all, you know, the edge of the, uh, the, the current credit card network. It's about also uh, money laundering and it's about, you know, uh, cross border scams. Uh, if I go to the next uh, page, what we have implemented so far to, uh, to address this problem uh, actually is not working very well. And if you look at the card holder level, uh, we still see the loss uh, that are growing. You know, now it's about tens of million dollars every month. Uh, we have only 40% of the, the fraud cases that are detected. And actually, 99.5% of these cases are false positive. They are not uh, fraud related. So, of course, we need to reduce false positive. We need to enhance the detection rate in a real time environment because we need also to bring flexibility for our uh, distribution, uh, distribution channels. So if I look at what, you know, the, 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 what's happening in the market, we can see thanks to the artificial intelligence, a shift from, uh, you know, traditional uh, logging and credential management, whether it is your username or your password, and we are moving uh, to uh, profiling uh, activities to a uh, risk-based authentication and trying to uh, uh, to uh, doing a user-based uh, behavior uh, analysis. And so this is what I will try to uh, to explain in the in the next slide. And before that, I would like to, uh, I would try not to be too much technical, but I would like to explain in few words, you know, what is uh, machine learning? And when we talk about computers being able to learn, actually we mean two things. First one is the ability to identify significant patterns and trends in a large quantity of data with increasing accuracy and, and efficiency. And the second point is the ability for computer algorithms to adapt to this data and to iterate automatically without having to be manually programmed. So this is what we mean. And when you look at the machine learning system, it's a computer program that actually that learns and that improves, you know, with experience without being explicitly programmed. Um, usually, it includes, you know, the following components. So the first block that you can see on the left of the slide about data collection. So is the data collection engine which stores raw data such as biometric, picture, video, typing speed, location, presential data, timestamps, all the kind of data that we can collect. So this is the first level of collection. The second level is to extract from this data collection what we call feature. So feature or signal that are, you know, graphical representation of all the input data that are representing, you know, significant relationship between the raw data points that are uh, more predictive than the raw data itself. So with this feature extraction, we are trying to build uh, graphic representation of, you know, all the raw data. Then we move to the next layer, which is the, the, the matching engine. It is also called the, the learner, which is the module that compares the prediction from the model that are stored in a, a database. You see that there is a template database with the actual outcome. And this is, uh, this will measure what is the distance between the outcome that you have received and the model that you use in the past for your, uh, for, for your uh, decision. And the last 
the last element is about uh, you know the uh, the engine so to 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 make the decision and the the decision is made by the difference between you know the the model and the outcome and by measuring this distance this is where that you can come to a conclusion whether you trust or you don't trust you know the the result of you know the the, the reasoning uh, i know that it's quite difficult to explain this in few slides but i try to um to do it without being too much technical and of course this is bringing lots of opportunities for us in terms of fraud management. So uh, I would like to explain now how this machine learning principle can apply to solving you know, the practical problem of spotting and blocking fraud in real time. So the first element is the adaptive and safe learning model where rather asking the machine, is this a fraud? based on the data that we have received, which is what we've been doing so far. Actually, the data, we will have data scientists who are going to teach the system by training the system and asking questions such as, to what extent is this transaction amount unusual for this individual person? So the model is continually adapting and evolving based on what it learns during the training period. And so the machine learning method, the only advice, and at the end, it is the human who decides. So this is one of the big, uh, the big advantage. The second one is that you have a real-time understanding of each individual. And this is what is great also, that it offers to us the opportunity to keep up with the foster without the risk of blocking, you know, genuine transaction. A machine learning fraud detection system works by understanding the normal patterns of behavior across, you know, every individual. And because you receive all the raw data linked to this individual, this is how we are able to, uh, to make the, the process specific to each individual. And it is done in real time. It is done at speed and at scale. And when the machine learning system spots an anomaly, okay, it automatically assesses the risk of this activity, whether it is fraudulent or not, and it can block the transaction or it can flag it. And then after, you can have an investigation that has been done by a fraud analyst. And the last element also that I want also to highlight here is that you end up with an individual uh, monitoring whether because you, by understanding individual behavior at speed and scale, machine learning enables the business to use real-time fraud scoring to block and detect, and detect fraud as it occurs, at the time that it occurs. And of course, it enables the business okay, to, uh, to strike a balance between stopping fraud and pre providing a friction-free customer experience. So the machine learning are able to adapt and to understand each customer normal pattern and behavior, which is a big plus to the current algorithm that we have that are based on statistical, based on statistical approach. So if you look at the platform that IATA has been putting together, so this is my next slide. This is what, at the moment, we are running a pilot project where we are bringing in the same environment, okay, all this information regarding the risk, we, uh, regarding so user behavior analytics, regarding sales transaction, uh, regarding the risk uh, ending capacities that we have in our system, uh, historic data about, you know, uh, application fraud, and uh, any kind of account takeover. And by bringing this inside the machine learning engine, this is where that we are running this machine and uh, this machine learning engine in order to get a, a better result. And I will show you in my next slide what I mean by a better result. I hope that you can see the slide because it's, it's quite a, a busy slide, but this is how it works. So in our case, so we receive multiple data streams 
from internal and external sources. So we are, we are receiving data from the GDS, the Global uh, Distribution System. We are receiving data from our own uh, settlement uh, system. We are receiving data from our agency management system. And of course, all these data are used to extract features. If you remember my previous slide on how uh, is working uh, a machine learning engine, you have the raw data first, and then after you have the feature extraction. So here, we are, we are extracting behavioral features from all the raw data, and we are linking this to statistical profile that are updated you know, in a real time, based on the on the on the most recent observation and transaction from you know the group uh, of transaction, and then after we move to the point number three, which is we are trying to detect any kind of anomaly, so any distance between the model and what we have been measured will trigger, of course, an anomaly, and it will trigger. Uh, uh, a special processing that will address, you know, the anomaly. And this helps to go to the next layer, which is the predictive layer, where we are, uh, the result of the anomaly detection is helping us to make, based on, uh, you know, the, the, the information that we got, you know, what is the level of risk to have a fraud, to churn the customer, or, you know, to have a normal purchase. And then after, it feeds uh, a, a workflow where you have actions, so the downstream system are fed with this information, whether they accept the transaction or whether they block the transaction. And the last element of this platform is to feedback the result for the next uh, level because the system is learning by, by itself. So the results are fed back into the platform, enabling self-learning and enabling the continuous adapting of all the context and in the, the profiling. So this is uh, an example, and this is the pilot that at the moment IATA is running with all uh, its data. And we can see that in terms of results, if the slide is changing, yes, exactly, sorry, I move too fast, I go back, okay. So the result that we can see from this proof of concept is the fraud is detected earlier. More often, remember that initially I started by telling you that 99% uh, of all the detections were false positive. In this case, we are able to detect a fraud even before the payment has, uh, has happened. Uh, the cost, of course, of the fraud are, are, uh, of, are greatly reduced by this. And the most important for us is that the genuine customer, they have a smoother experience and they have less interruption. So this is why this platform is for us a great opportunity because it brings value on both sides. For the customer, the experience is better. And of course, for us, you know, the fraud detection is better and the loss are, are reduced. And I am coming to my conclusion. Uh, which is, what is important for an airline? Is it important to have a lot of baggage handlers, or is it important to have more data scientists? So we are moving into a world where artificial intelligence will uh, facilitate and will augment all the activities of everybody, and probably the more data scientists you will have in your company, the better you will be able to adapt to your customer and the better you will be able to make your own business safe. So this being said, I am coming to the end of my, uh, of my presentation. Remember that IATA is in a business that connects and enrich our world. And of course, later after the end of the webinar, I will be, able, I will be happy to answer to any question you might have.
Pascal, thank you for some fascinating insights and uh, a look ahead at what IATA is involved with on this issue. Now we go to Diego Casas Novas of Air Europa, who is going to share his airline's journey in successfully managing fraud issues. Diego? Yes. Thank you, Didi. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to go a bit further on my background. Um, Air Europa belongs to a vertical travel group called Globalia, which, besides Air Europa, uh, owns travel agencies, uh, tour operators, and hotels, among other businesses. I joined Globalia back in 2004, and, and I worked there for, for nine years in, in project management, uh, so nothing to do with payments and fraud. But uh, so I knew, or I already knew the company. Uh, then I, I left Globalia, in, and between 2013 and 2017, I, I worked for three uh, different OTAs. And, and that's where I started learning and, and getting special, uh, specialized in, in payments and fraud. <clears throat> uh, in, in last October, I joined back uh, Air Europa as a payments and fraud manager. So I have been just roughly seven months uh, in Air Europa, but it was not really a fresh start as I already knew so many people from my past role. Um, so I, th I think it was worth mentioning this uh, as uh, it would have been much more difficult to, to achieve what we've done uh, if I had not known the people so, so closely. Um, so Europa was born uh, back in the 80s uh, as a charter company uh, flying between basic mainly between Spain and, and the UK it was it was uh, owned by a, by a, a British uh, tour operator in 1991 uh, it was bought by its current owner which is a self-made businessman that had already a, a travel agency and a, a tour operator uh, you can see here in in the in the slides some some of the milestones of of our history. Uh, but summarizing, uh, since the beginning of the 90s and and for the next 20 years, uh, the main strategy was to have uh, touristic destinations in alignment with Globalia Tour Operator, and it was basically to feed the Spanish holiday market through travel agencies. <clears throat> So, therefore, the main sales channels were indirect, was, were basically uh, sh selling share sheets for tour operators and, and selling uh, tickets through GDS, so through global uh, dis uh, distribution systems like Amadeus, to travel agencies and mainly to the Spanish market. Uh, for so many years, the website was not really meant uh, to sell. It was more like a, a showcase. Uh, we were an airline, so we were supposed to have uh, a website, but um, the, the, the team was, was, didn't have the experience and, the, and there were no resources uh, as the, the airline management did not consider it a, a, a strategic channel. <clears throat> so, so three years ago, uh, there was a generational replacement, and the the, the son of of the founder took place as CEO of the group, and and he started empowering the online channels uh, across the group, and in the case of Europa, it was the, the website, of course. So there were uh, there was a new team was built, and there were m much more resources put there. A um, uh, new website was launched, a uh, new architecture, uh, not only the, the front end, but the, the back end um, product. So uh, routes and, and product was, was um, 
adapted to the to this new channel. Uh, there was also a new a new, a new mobile app to, to perform checking and and to buy to sell ancillaries, and 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 there were yeah there was a, a new a team with UX experts with uh, focused uh, market marketing online. There is a social network team as well, and in the IT part, uh, people with experience in 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 backend architecture for online uh, commerces. There were some other changes in the company. Uh, was a, a new a new fleet. Uh, uh, we have now so many seven eight seven Dreamliners. Uh, there was a new strategy regarding the routes. Uh, um, we main focus was now is now in in Latin America. Um, in some cases, we we are the only airline with direct flights to 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 Europe from some main cities in Latin America. So in that sense, the, the, there is now less dependency on the travel and touristic part uh, and the Spanish market. So in that sense, Europa has, beca has become more international. <clears throat> um, so we, when you put this, all this together, uh, the result is that the website starts to grow a, a lot. Uh, and that was what happened uh, last year. Uh, and with, with that grow, with that growth uh, came as well the fraud rate, the, the fraud, right? Uh, the, there was uh, we started experience uh, several uh, severe fraud attacks, uh, but as that had never happened before, uh, there were no means to stop uh, these these attacks. Uh, so, as the website had not had not been so strategic until that moment, fraud had not been a real issue. It was just uh, it was considered an expense, um, and the volume of the website had been so low that even with with had high fraud rates, uh, the acquirers and the schemes were not concerned. They were not. Uh, uh, bothering us in that sense. So we had a, an in-house rules-based tool. Um, it was it was uh, it was inefficient, as the, the fraud rate was over one percent, and and it had a, a very high rejection uh, ratio over ten percent. Um, but when the volume went so high, so did the fraud and the our, the the schemes through our cars started to warn uh, Air Europa um, about these these rates, and and you just cannot ignore the, this that anymore. Um, so we had to do some changes in terms of uh, efficiency. In terms of of culture, uh, fraud was uh, stopping sales as our in-house rules were inefficient. The the e-commerce team uh, would have to take the responsibility of facing the challenges of e-commerce fraud. It was it, it couldn't be treated as uh, an expense anymore. So there were two strategic decisions uh, taken. First one was hiring someone uh, expert in payments and fraud. So that was me. Um, I had the, also the advantage of, of knowing the company very well. And the second one was to look for a, a strategic partner to, to solve our fraud problems. Uh, <clears throat> so, let me let me share some considerations when when in regards to, to fraud prevention tools. Um, first one has to do with, with the business model of the solution. Uh, so most of the current pro fraud prevention tools in the market have a, a transaction based price model. So that is you pay so many cents 
per transaction, no matter the outcome. Uh, but in the last years, another approach has come up being a riskified its best, its, its best exponent, in my opinion. And this approach offers a chargeback warranty. So merchants will only pay for approved transactions at a higher cost than the previous model, but in exchange, a riskify will cover the potential chargebacks. Um, there are many, many opinions to which model is better. I don't, I don't think they, uh, we should uh, compare them uh, fully. I think each solution is best fit for a specific circumstance. So, for example, in our case, a company without hardly fraud prevention experience, uh, the acquires and, and the schemes coming after us, um, the need to solve the problem quickly, this was the this is the perfect solution. In some other merchants, the solution can can be combined with standard ones for specific risky markets or products or salt sales channels. And, and you can also consider it as a, a level of outsourcing strategy. So how much how much do you want to get your hands dirty in fraud related issues? Do you want to forget completely? Uh, Manu, uh, what I think, in my opinion, is that the good thing, the good advantage is of this model is that the better uh, Riskify would perform, the better would be for 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 us and for them. So in that sense, the partnership is stronger than the standard model. It's a it's a win-win par partnership. Uh, in, secondly, there is a technology. Uh, um, an IT approach, um, and you can see, you can say there are here basically two two models, two two way of see of of, of work. Um, there are tools that are rules rule based, and then the, and then there are the ones that are machine learning based. And you also have hybrid models that combine both, but you can also say that. Um, that uh, which ones can be run entirely with ML and which ones not. So at the end, it comes up again to the to the to the first differentiation. Uh, so Pascal has already talked talked about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in his presentation. I'm I'm going to give him my opinion from a merchant perspective. So I think that whatever tool is chosen, it has it should be run by machine learning. Um, so Google doesn't have a team of uh, thousand analysts changing static rules to decide if an email is a spam or not. It's just not scalable, scalable. it's not efficient. And, and in my opinion, this is the same applies here. Uh, another reason is that uh, rule-based tools, because they are configured by, by humans, can handle a limited number of parameters. The minute you start incorporating uh, sophisticated data points like browsing, browsing uh, patterns, it just cannot be handled by, by humans. Just It can only be handled by a, a machine. Uh, it's also true that the fact that Europa had very little previous experience with fraud uh, analytics and fraud prevention was was an advantage for us, uh, as it, it happens in many organizations that the, the fraud team is can be reluctant to move to machine learning based solutions. This is already happening in many other areas. People are concerned of of losing their jobs because a machine is going to do this. But I think that I, it, it should be embraced uh, and that the roles. Just as Pascal was mentioning, the role should change from analyzing and changing rules in an endless loop, or even screening orders by one uh, one by one. They they should they should change to to a role of supervising performance of the fraud prevention tools, um, analyze KPIs, trends, etc. So fr fraud analyst teams should become data experts to the extent that the organizations are, are able to cope with that. So uh, when you combine the chargeback warranty and the machine learning, 
uh, the best solution for us was risky fight, and that's how we made our decision. Uh, the outcome uh, for the last six months we've been working with risky fight. The fraud rate has dropped very much, uh, and the best proof of, of that is that uh, we are we don't have an issue with acquires and schemes anymore. So that's first goal achieved. But uh, much more interesting and, and surprising, um, our acceptance rate has increased a lot uh, as we. As we have done so many other improvements, it is very difficult to know exactly how much of our two-digit growth this year is, is due to riskified. But but it's it is very relevant. Um, I'm I'm I think this this figure of five percent is conservative. I'm I think it's at least twice. So yeah, very good results here. And lastly, a uh, couple of takeaways. So prepare for tomorrow challenges today. Um, we 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 ha had to rush in 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 the fraud uh, example. Um, we we will try not to do this mistake in the future. Uh, and a very nice example is uh, PSD2, for example, it uh, has an impact in in e-commerce with a strong authentication, and and we are already getting prepared for that. Um, use experts, uh, same same could apply for for the PSD2. Uh, we are talking to people, going to conferences and getting prepared for next year what's going to happen. And for last, uh, cross-departmental cooperation is key. Yeah, this is, it was, it was difficult. Um, my, my suggestions here, um, do not impose, um, make, a, make it a, a common goal for, for all the departments involved and, and proof improvement with real facts and with real numbers is is uh, a very powerful tool and that is all on my side thanks for your time and yako thank you so much for sharing your journey and the successful outcomes there now we're going to go to Emily Grunzweig of Riskified, who is going to give us an in-depth analysis of how fraud issues are playing out in the airline marketplace and what you can do about it. Over to you, Emily. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you, Didi. Also, thank you, Pascal and Iago. This was extremely interesting, and uh, I might steal uh, some of your phrases in my own uh, presentation now. Uh, we'll start talking about how uh, overcoming online travel unique uh, fraud challenges and how to do that. My name is Emily Grunzweig. I'm a senior fraud analyst in Data Insights and Riskified. I've been in the company for the past four and a half years. Um, so just a quick uh, brief of what we're going to talk about. We will briefly cover an, uh, an overview of the opportunity and challenges of the online travel market. Then we'll go a bit into depth about how fraud looks in the travel industry. It's a bit different than other industries. And we'll also talk about how to manage this risk. And then we will continue with what we call the false declines, but is even more than false declines. It's your conversion rates, it's your drop-off rates, it's your lost sales and all the costs around them. And we will wrap this up with a case study uh, that hopefully will present uh, a, an interesting angle of uh, fraud in fraud challenges in the travel industry. Uh, just a bit about Riskified. Riskified is the world's leading e-commerce fraud prevention solution. Uh, I think uh, the presenters before me have talked about uh, the advantages of machine learning, which I completely agree with, and also our model, which is uh, a partnership, meaning it's scalable 
with higher approval rates, but no risk on your side, meaning it's risk-free as a chargeback guarantee solution. Um, we we also work with uh, leading brands, uh, and we work with them in different ways, a bit like Kiago explained. There is no one solution that fits all merchants. We have merchants that are sending us uh, their overloads, meaning they're out of office orders or risky segments because they do have internal tools for most of their orders and they work well. We have merchants that are sending us all their orders because they need instant decisions. We sometimes work pre-authorization or after authorization. really depends on the merchant needs. It's a partnership and we should all benefit from it. But what I also want to maybe uh, talk about for a second is we work with merchants from different industries and different geographies, which is extremely important in this market. And I'll touch this uh, in the next slide uh, when talking about the opportunity and challenges. So the opportunity, I'm quite sure most of you know better than me, but this industry, the online travel industry, is growing and is growing in high numbers. The digital sales are projected to grow in uh, more than 10% annually, meaning by latest projections, they're supposed to get to up to more than $850 billion in 2021, which is a very big increase in the past years. And the trap and the airlines and air companies are also growing, whether it's the organic growth with, as part of the growth of the market, whether it's international growth when you're expanding with a lot of mergers and even with the offering. We have seen that in the past year and going on, a lot of uh, travel merchants are also offering not just flights, but hotels, dynamic packages, cars, transportation, even entertainment. A lot of, um, of offerings are merged here and that is why it's important to understand if I'll take uh, Pascal's uh, explanation about machine learning. Machine learning is based on data and relevant data, meaning if you're growing to the hotels market, you need to have experience with hotels. Uh, so uh, having a wide range of uh, industry experience is extremely important here. Um, now I want to talk a bit about the main challenges. Uh, as you probably are well aware, this is a very commoditized market, meaning it's more competitive. You have a lot of competitors in a way fighting for the same deals. We have very high acquisition costs, causing, with other costs, slim margin usually. And this together means that you really can't have even more costs than you need, and you do have them because you have a lot of fraud. And it's the travel industry is targeted by fraudsters, and as it's digital products, and you usually need to have a very quick turnover and immediate response, it's targeted by sophisticated fraudsters that are not only doing fraud, but also trying to abuse your system. We will talk about it a bit more, but what this is causing is the false declines. Merchants are aware of the fact that they have uh, fraud and sometimes using measures that aren't fitted enough, causing a bad customer experience, false declines, customer drop-off, and we will uh, continue talking about this. Um, we have, this is, uh, these false declines usually is enhanced by uh, three additional challenges, uh, very relevant to uh, the travel industry. One of them is the fact that travel is inherently international. You have people from around the world. So your usual basic thought system that is very focused on geographics and geographic mismatches isn't very reliable here, isn't very relevant. So you need to offer, you're offering a product that is worldwide to an inherently worldwide clientele, which causes a lot of issues in outdated systems. The chronology that 24-7 uh, service that you are uh, you are giving your customers is not just the fact that you need to have a 24-7 system working, it's also being in a state of mind that understands that while you're getting the order in the middle of the night, it's actually someone from a different country trying to buy an immediate ticket for right now. So this also presents a very, a very uh, high uh, false declines and uh, fraud uh, issue. 
We also have mobile sales. Mobile has been in the past year around 40% of, uh, of the orders in the airline industry in the U.S. It's also growing, and it's also growing within the millennials and other younger customer bases, which are even more, um, they even respond in a, in a bad way to a false declines more than other customers. It also has very specific challenges and different behaviors that would have been once identified as related to fraud, but in mobile, it is not. One basic example would be last minute orders, which are very risky. We will talk about it soon in, uh, in usual desktop orders, but in mobile orders, it's more common. So now uh, we'll start talking about the fraud and uh, risk management, but uh, I think we have a poll now, right? So I can see the poll was launched. We would like to know how well are most of your orders reviewed for fraud. There are several groups. Uh, obviously, there are other groups that we might have missed here, but we, and I would love to see your response for this. Oh, wow, I'm seeing the results. Um, this is very interesting. I don't know if you can see them, but uh, I will read them out. Most of you are using uh, third-party automated solutions, which is uh, 40%. But then we have 20% off manual review and 20%, other 20% off rule-based systems, and other 20% that use another solution, which I would be uh, very interested in uh, understanding what that one is. Very interesting, good to know. I will try to address this in the now. Uh, so let's just uh, briefly go over this in general. In the e-commerce and the fraud prevention uh, industry, we talk about three different types of fraud. We talk about basic fraud, the more uh, professional uh, or industry specific fraud. And here we'll talk about specifically industry professional fraud in the travel industry. And we also have what is the most growing challenge in the e-commerce uh, market in general, which is account takeovers, with the twist, I'll call it, but it's a bad twist, of the loyalty fraud, which is very targeted on the travel industry. So we will go over this. Um, what we have... What we will talk about now is uh, basic fraud. Basic fraud is basically uh, self-usage fraud, meaning it's a uh, customer and the passenger that are the same, someone that is buying a ticket for himself or for an immediate friend or family member. It's not something very systematic. It doesn't get to high velocities, but it could build up. So in the general fraud market you, industry, you would talk about uh, mismatches that can be resolved someone shipping to a different, uh, very distant uh, place with an IP from a different country. A lot of uh, usually geographic mismatches that are alerting. But then the travel industry, it, it isn't exactly so. Because as we said, the geography is different. Usually you will have a geographic mismatch in a travel order, whether it's a destination or your origin. Some, something will be in a different place. That's why you're traveling. So what you would usually need to take a look at here is the risky segments. We have identified what you might know or might not, but that the, the time before purchasing the actual, uh, the, the time before the actual flight is a very risk-based indicator. Usually last minute orders are riskier, riskier quite a lot. Even the number of people that are buying a ticket or if it's a return or just a one-way ticket. All of these are risky segments. But what is important is not just the segment, but identifying the combination, because what we're trying to understand is the behavior. And as Iago said before, while you, 
we can do this in a manual way, but this isn't really scalable. And also, we cannot identify all the very specific indicators that are matching this combination. So identifying the risky segments is important, but the combination, whether it's mobile order plus when the order was placed, that would be a more accurate segment to identify the combination. Another basic uh, pattern that you might have a lot in the travel industry is uh, what is known as friendly fraud. And here you can see that we are calling it flyer buyers. What we mean by liar buyers is understanding that liar buyers are actually legitimate customers using their own credit cards, but then lying about the fact that they used it. They, they're usually trying to abuse your cancellation policies or chargeback policies. So the first thing you should do when you have this case, which is sometimes even impossible to identify before because these are the legitimate customers making the actual order, is to tag them. Tag them by the way they retrieved your goods. Also record the evidence. Uh, most of the airlines can do that, meaning you should see what, you should try and cross check if this customer actually, actually boarded the flight. You can do that when you're an airline and this combination is extremely important. So tagging is extremely important for these. Now let's talk a bit about the professional fraud. Um, we will give you here two examples for uh, major tactics of professional travel fraud. Uh, just to bear in mind, the professional fraud travel fraud uh, travel fraudsters, sorry, are people who know how your system works. It, your rule-based system won't work here. It will always be one step behind them. They know how the system works and they're using methods to overcome it, meaning that they know you are using an IP detection, they will use a proxy. They will use an RDP, which is a remote desktop control. They will use any other way to disguise their actual identity and location while trying to create a fake legit feeling. But it's not only this. They're also working in groups and in identifying your soft spots, your potential soft spots, and how to take advantage of them. Meaning if you're not constantly updating your rule or fraud system, they will be one step ahead of you. And you should remember here that they love working in groups again, so sharing the knowledge and success stories and MOs, and that will be repeated. You will see them again and again and again. So let's start with the first method. It's, uh, we call it the additional uh, passenger. It's kind of a mixed cart in the physical industry. In the physical uh, goods industry, uh, they have both digital and physical products. So this is kind of a travel version for this. In this method, fraudsters are placing an order that looks extremely legit. The billing details are of the credit card holder and they're buying tickets for the card holder. The passenger name would be the card holder. Sometimes they actually invest in it and they add family members. They can easily find them on the social media. Remember, they are working at this. So this looks good, right? Someone is buying a ticket for him and his wife and both their children. This is why this usually slips. As they know your system, and as we've seen a lot of rule-based systems are here, uh, they can carefully just add, after the, after the system actually approved this because it's good enough, they carefully add an unrelated passenger name. And this one is the actual beneficiary of this fraud endeavor. Um, so the first tip here is not to be blinded by the good indicator, but actually trying to see what would the fraud be. And knowing this in advance, meaning you need to change your mindset and look for this clue. Another tip for this kind of uh, fraud is that these kind of fraudsters tend to try and connect you by phone because they know they need to bypass your IP detection system. Be even more uh, tentative about these ones, these phone orders. The other method that I would like to talk with you about is uh, what we call the agent fraud. 
an online version of what was once uh, the ticket broker. This happens when a fraudster, uh, fraudster try to create a broker or a uh, fake agent website. Sometimes it looks exactly like an OTA website or some other legitimate looking website. And then they try to attract the innocent customers by offering low rates for flight tickets and fraud forums and travel groups on social media. Then after attracting this innocent customer, they get money. They get the money from that innocent customer, usually a wire transfer, but could be in any other way. They, the fraudsters, the fake agents, order the tickets from your website with a third person stolen CC. These credit card details are easily bought in the dark web for even like several bucks for a ticket. Then they send the ticket to their innocent customer, which does not know what is happening behind his back, getting the money from him, the full money, leaving you with the chargeback to handle eventually, and a very upset customer that didn't even know he's buying from this fake website, and he will probably be angry also at you. This is also kind of a perfect spot for the fraudsters because nothing is related to them. They don't get the money, and they never actually create some interaction with your website. So our first tip here would be to pay attention, attention to the digital addresses. This is another, as we said about professional fraud, this is a systematic fraud method, meaning there will be some hidden link between these group of fake agents. With uh, They might be with similar email domains. New email domains are uh, always uh, a very good clue to identify this kind of fraud. You should try and see if you can uh, check what the email domain ages, when was it created, how does the website actually look, um, you can obviously do this manually for each order, but this has it, uh, a lot of uh, scalability issues. This is also something that you can Im implement within your system. This could be fully automated. We have this kind of features. You should track the IPs, whether they are connected, or even the patterns. Patterns are a word that I'm going to say a lot in this type of fraud. It's identifying the repeated patterns of email usernames or email domains or same devices that are being used. So when handling this professional fraud, besides the tip that we were talking about, the first thing you should understand is who is actually getting the goods and how they are retrieved. Why am I saying this? Because you sometimes think that you're sending an order by the email and that's the, that's the, and that's the digital shipping address that you need to look. First of all, this is true. You need to check the email. You also need to check the mobile, the actual device. Most of you probably have some kind of mobile app or a way to retrieve the card with the mobile. Also, mobile is a stronger link. A lot of people have different emails, but how many of us use different mobiles? So the mobile is a very important link. The device fingerprinting is extremely important here. And this is a change of your mindset. So you need to be aware of your own flow. For, and even is the customer able to change the recipient email or retrieve way after ordering? And then you should probably re-review the end device again. So you should identify the customer who is actually placing the order by the device, the geographic indications, the IP, but I'm talking about the real IP with a good proxy, proxy detection system. Um, it means that you have to have one in place because if you don't have a good proxy detection, you're working with what might be a fake IP and just you are blindfolded. And to top this, what is really important here is what we said, the patterns and the linking. These pros, they work together. They are linked. Whether it's the IPs, it's the similar devices, they're, they're trying to use the methods that work. They're sharing the success story and they're using it until it doesn't work anymore and then they will share another one. So these links might be your way to identify this. Always think of patterns. Now we'll talk a bit about ATOs, um, but I think uh, what Pascal said in the beginning is actually very important you get some kind of core, 
there's a tool, you get some kind of core for the order, and then you have the trust level. Do I trust this customer or don't I? And if you trust them, you will enable him something that is is easier and something that you wouldn't allow your other customers. And this is exactly how the fraudsters try to to use the ATO. They're hacking into your customer's account because they want to use your better customer experience, your more lenient uh, uh, offering towards these loyal customers. So what we will see there a lot of times is very similar to the fraud, the actual traditional fraud, but you, you're not looking because you allow your customers, your loyal customers to change their device or add a payment, a new payment method. Something that you will re review for a new customer, but for an old customer, you want to give them a good experience. So this is like the gray area and this is what is exploited. So of course you always need to take a look at the geographic IP change or is it a device change? Are they using something different? Is this is it a different time zone that they're connecting from? While this in the travel industry actually has a lot of good uh, offerings, it is indicative also of uh, account takeover, the behavior, the immediacy, a lot of data points that are interesting. But what is more important here is understanding that the key to detect ATOs, account takeovers, is the login step. If you catch your fraudster in the checkout and not before that, your own customer has his, has been compromised. His data has already been compromised. So while you're looking for all the indication we were talking about, you're also looking for something that is before the login level. It means you're looking for login from different devices, as we've said, but also the browsing before the login, the password entry behavior. Did they copy paste it? How many uh, keyboard strokes do they have? Also, you want to try and catch bots, which are doing some credential phishing, and you don't want to let them do that. There are, these are ways that you can do this, and this is extremely important to do pre-login, because if you don't do that, again, you have compromised your customers. But the travel market has also what we call the loyalty issue, which makes this issue even more important, and more important on the step before, on the login level. This is when customers have the sh have some kind of shopping credit in their account or other benefits like miles or rewards or uh, free drinks, which makes the fraudsters' jobs actually easier because they don't need to add a payment method. And in this case, you don't even have some kind of tip off of change method to let you know that something is fishy. So you have people that you also have people that are creating those fake accounts only for the loyalty benefit. I think uh, I've seen uh, a presentation lately about uh, a study indicating that 10% of new accounts are created only for this matter. And this is not something that you want happening, but you need to work on this in advance. But as we said, these are this is your trust level. These are your loyal customers. And you don't want to decline more more of them. So a decline, a false decline issue here would be even more hurtful than usual. So we've talked about the visible fraud and the visible costs that you've seen when you get a chargeback or entered in an excessive chargeback program. But sometimes it's not that. Something sometimes there is something that you are missing, and I can tell you uh, that we approve. And from our database with the travel merchants that we've been working with, we retrieved between 40 and 70% of orders that they previously declined. We're not talking about the entire fraud cycle. We're talking about orders that were declined by merchants, whether by high friction methods like uh, Freebie Secure or Manual Analyst or just auto declines and a lot of other measures. Only from these, we approve this much. So. This is how many good customers that you just lost. Um, and as you can see in this graph, more than 20% of your customers that have been declined will never come back to you and will go to a competitor's website. So 
And remember that it's not just lost revenue or sales. It's also lost acquisition costs. It's also hurting your brand name. So why is this happening? Why do we have this kind of uh, false decline issues? Um, I've split it to two, three reasons. Uh, the first one, I think uh, Iago talked about it a lot So uh, and, and, and presented their case, which is always better. So just briefly, uh, the first reason would be outdated fraud systems. It's when your system misidentifies fraud. Um, as I think I said before, it happens a lot in mobile. But it happens a lot in uh, the travel industry in general, as Iago uh, stated. I can give you some orders if you want after, after that. The other reason is not just the decline, but what is actually causing your drop-off rates or abandoned cart rates to, and they are making them too high. There are a lot of non-fraud related issues to this for uh, abandoned carts and drop-off rates, but if someone actually gets to your checkout page, starts to put in their payment details, but then suddenly left, this might be a very good indication that your fraud system is the bottleneck. So overload or unscalable solution could be one option for this. Your, uh, your customers are waiting too much uh, and you don't have time to handle this. Could be out of office hours or shopping peaks uh, before the holidays or many other reasons. But the other reason is high friction verification measures. It could create some manual review issues, but one of the main uh, issues that we've identified as a high friction problem uh, issue is the 3D secure. You can see on uh, the slide now presented, it's uh, an extreme drop off rate from uh, one of our merchants' uh, extensive research. They've researched this as they've identified this as a problem for them. And they split the drop off rates by different geographies. So you can see you have countries where you have 3% of drop-off rates only due to 3D Secure, but this is not a lot as the 47 and 50 you're seeing. So the 3D Secure uh, is creating a great drop-off rate, as you see, but is also very hurtful for your international growth. As you see, in different markets, markets do not accept this topic. And this is not something you will see in your other approval rates or decline rates or fraud rates. This is something you'll see in your conversion rates and drop-off rates. So I thought a good example to wrap this up uh, would be uh, to see the, these uh, visible and hidden false decline effects with a case study. Uh, this is uh, one of our merchants that was managing the actual, let's call it fraud quite well for what they saw. They didn't, they worked in the visa excessive uh, chargeback program and they had what they thought was a manageable fraud rate, but with a lot of uh, fraud costs around it that were quite high. They had both manual review team and other internal tools, but something was hurting their international growth. And the letter identified one of those reasons to be the 3D secure drop-off issue. So as we said before, we fit our solution to merchants' needs. Uh, this merchant obviously wanted to stay with uh, a low, uh, low fraud, uh, fraud rate while maintaining a very slick and quick customer experience. And they wanted us to sit what they call pre-authorization. So the results came quite quickly. We could see that as Yago presented, you have reduced overhead costs, a better customer experience, lower chargeback rates, uh, product representment process even, but we've seen also a 8% approval rate lift. So this 8% is, a lot of it is because of the 3D Secure we managed to approve, but it's not only that. They also had, because we, we have set this for the authorization level, what we've seen after is that after using this, they got higher authorization levels, rates from their banks, from the, their payment uh, payment facilitate, facilitator. And that is very, that's the actual point I wanted to point out here is that you should, we were talking about your fraud rates that you should check and other ROI measures, conversion rates, abandoned card rates, but also take a look at your authorization rates. This is not a fixed number. If you ha are doing a better 
and more accurate job before that, you will get approved in higher amounts. And you will also gain your returning customers. And that will be quite quickly. Um, Well, I'm sorry, I've just seen that the slides aren't, haven't moved. Um, so I think uh, we can wrap it up in this. And uh, let's go to the Q&A part. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, we are going to go to our audience questions. And uh, we've got time for two, I think. And the first one um, is, and I shall read this for you, and this is a question for Pascal. Biometrical data are a very special personal data. Such kind of authentication needs to be complied with GDPR, which of course is the um, General Data Protection Regulation. My question is, how IATA plans to protect such data? Do you have already any mechanism to protect it, or is it still under development? Pascal? Yes, it is. Thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's a complex uh, question. Um, so, yes, of course, <coughs> biometrics, like any other personal data, will have to be protected. Um, at the moment, the way it is designed, this biometrics data are staying on the mobile device. And what we receive is only the result of the check of the validation. So we are not planning to store biometric data. What we are trying to do, we are trying to work with all the, uh, the industry to integrate the usage of this biometric data in order to facilitate the process. For example, if I, if I use the example of uh, an automatic gate at the airport that will check your password, your, your passport. Actually, the, the device will scan your passport, will, re, will read your biometrics in the password, will compare with the picture that they will take of you, and then you will, you will be cleared. So in this case, it is the device that is using the biometrics data that has to comply with GDPR. But us, of course, we are going to, to receive the results of this validation, but we are not planning to use and to store biometric data. Thank you very much, Pascal. But don't go away, because here is another question for you. Um, common use platforms, airlines, shared kiosks, counters, yeah. self-bag drops in the air transport industry represent a unique extra challenge when it comes to payments, where several merchants share the hardware, the pin pads, owned either by the airport authority or the community of merchants or airlines. This was and is a huge stopper for PCI. How does IATA approach this particular channel? Pascal? So yes, I can confirm that it's uh, it's a nightmare because we have to comply with PA, with PCI DSS, and when you're running a, a common use a, a desktop, it is quite difficult. So we have a working group with the airport, with the airline, with all the service provider in the airline to find out things that are acceptable and to implement to design controls that will give us the compliance with PCI DSS, but controls also that will be accepted by airline and by the operators in the, um, in the airport. So the, where this working group is helping us to define what is acceptable. Usually we are driven by the use case. So it is the airline and it is also the GSSA that are working on their behalf at the airport that are telling us what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and what is the level of risk that we need, uh, we need to access. Pascal, thanks for that. Now, I want to thank all of our uh, audience today for being with us, and I would like to thank our speakers, Pascal Buchner from IATA, Diego Casasnovas from 
Air Europa and Emily Grunzweig, Senior Fraud and Data Insights Analyst from Riskified. Thank you to our sponsors, Riskified and Data. Uh, I'm Dee Doak. I'm signing off from London. Good afternoon. <laughs>